Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, private property, and free market laissez-faire capitalism. You are listening to WHUS Stores. This is 91.7 FM, also in HD. You can check us out on the web at whus.org. Now, today I have a special guest on the show, uh, Mark Gutman. Um, he is an, um, an emergency physician. He has been an activist, a libertarian activist, for 12 years, and he has uh, released a book and edited a book called Why Liberty, Personal Journeys uh, Towards Freedom. So I wanted to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining me today, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to um, get a little bit of your background. The uh, introduction to your book was uh, called First Do No Harm, and uh, you talked a little bit about that, and you talked a little bit about your journeys towards uh, peace and liberty, and I'd like, to, I'd like you to expound on that just a little bit, if you could. Sure. Well, the title, First Do No Harm, as you probably know, comes from uh, the Hippocratic Oath, and uh, it's an oath I took as a physician, and it, uh, it makes a lot of sense in medicine, because we work really hard as physicians to not harm our patients. You know, we factor in all the adverse effects, maybe from a, a diagnostic test or a medicine, um, to make sure we don't harm anybody. And that, I, feel, well, I understand that now to be, you know, either the natural law or the law that the United States was founded on, that we were supposed to have a government that was to protect us and help us, but not initiate far, harm against any innocent people. And cer- certainly shouldn't have been used by some individuals to harm other individuals. So I thought that would be a really appropriate title for what I was trying to say. And the, and the book is a collection of 55 authors from 15 countries talking about their path to liberty and their, you know, kind of revelations and insights and understandings that made them realize that, you know, liberty is not only peaceful and moral but universally beneficial for, you know, everyone. So, you know, my path... You know, it started off, you know, I graduated college and I started backpacking. I spent about a half a year in Africa by myself, hitchhiking and feeling really free. I mean, I was pitching tents wherever I ended up and hitchhiking and just having a ball and felt very little restrictions on my activity. And it really was a stark contrast. And and, I didn't even really realize it when I was in the States or... I guess that's really the only place I'd ever been otherwise was in the States. I, and I didn't realize how restricted we are here and really how much that affects the psyche. And, you know, part of it is just, you know, being young and, and by yourself and adventuring, but there really were very little restrictions on me. But I did have the opportunity to speak with, you know, many people along the way, and I wasn't really aware enough or thoughtful enough at that time to ask too many questions, but there was definitely a sense of the people who lived in Africa that there were lots of restrictions on them when they were trying to ende- endeavor economically. There was bribes or, you know, regulations or just a myriad of things that would keep them from being actually able to, you know, add value and create value and trade value and just improve their own well-being. And that was apparent. And then when I got back to the States, you know, I had been, you know, fairly just kind of accepted my whole life that, you know, state intervention was, you know, there to help us and, you know, these regulations were there to protect us from any you know, excesses of the free market and things like that. And I never thought much about it. I wasn't a critical thinker in that way for much of my life or much of my early life. And I got back and I was in San Francisco and they just passed a law about smoking bans and private property. And I was like, what? Well, this is just, this doesn't seem right. And I was just having a conversation with my brother and he's like, and you, you know, he's just kind of explaining just kind of how my mind was kind of changing on some ideas. And he's like, you know, you sound like a libertarian. And I started reading, so he, you know, he introduced me to Harry Brown that he just started re- reading recently, and Harry Brown was just such an eye-opener for me. I mean, the guy, you know, I've heard him speak, I've met him, and I read his writings, and he was just such a, a, a terrific guy who wrote so simply about peace and prosperity and just, just how to react, you know, interact morally with each other, and that was just my introduction. And then, you know, I, like, like with most people, it evolved, and you learn more, and then you have some, you question yourself, or you have some reaffirming experiences, and... That was a pretty long-winded answer, but that's just how it all started for me. No, that's a great answer. And and what you were talking about when you were uh, hitchhiking and backpacking uh, really reminded me of uh, Henry David Thoreau. And when he was out in nature, he uh, said the state... 
uh, is nowhere to be found here. Uh, you know, it's not over here hassling me. It's not bothering me. It's not taxing me. It's not, it's not doing anything because I'm out wandering around. Now, if you start a business, however, if you start to actually exchange with others and trade and, and really start to set up shop, then they're going to come knocking at your door. Um, but I, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic introduction to it. And then you started reading more about it and, and realizing that what you experienced, this freedom, uh, was, was fantastic and really what you wanted. Yeah. I mean, it was just liberating, uh, emotionally and spiritually and I mean, not to get too dramatic about it, but it, it felt great. And then just feeling the, restri- the restrictions around me and it, you know, I guess that maybe is how it starts for people. They have some kind of brush up with the government or some, some sort of obstacle or obstruction to what they want to do or some sort of burden that has been put on them. And maybe they, they, they start feeling that kind of friction and maybe that's how the thing starts. Maybe a little bit of, of selfishness or just personal experience. But then I think what happens as you, as you read about history from, a, from that perspective or you read about you know current events or um, just you know, current policy or foreign invasions, or I think you start getting a sense like, man, you know, this is just harming everyone. I mean, state aggression is just, I mean, it, the, the more you look into it, the more it seems like the, the, the great amount of violence and harm done to individuals, especially peaceful, innocent individuals in the world, has been done by the state. I mean, and then it's hard to ignore. I mean, once you, once you open that up and you start thinking like, gosh, I mean, like, there's so many, I mean, we could be so much happier and freer and greener and cleaner and you know, more prosperous if we didn't harm each other through these mechanisms, which, you know, a lot of people think are, you know, altruistic in helping people. So it's just, it, it becomes a very, I think for most people, especially most libertarians, it becomes a, a, a very selfless thing where you start worrying about all these people that you have nothing to do with and they don't directly affect your life, but you're just, you just start feeling their frustrations and their impositions and, and you just, the injustice of it all, you know? Absolutely. I, I never realized how much uh, the state intervenes in people's affairs until I, I until I started studying these things. And your book really outlined that a lot. You see a lot of people who try to do things. They really tried to, uh, you know, start a business or uh, go out of their way to help people or even just live their lives. And you see them uh, either their their dreams being crushed or you know uh, their their property being taken. Um, the, the book really affected me emotionally. Oh, good. Because I, uh, I, I mean, I empathized heavily with the people in the book. I, I looked at it from their perspective. I really tried to see things from their eyes. And um, uh, I, I witnessed uh, the objectives they had in mind, starting businesses or finding the highest quality good in a, in a world where those goods are regulated out of existence or um, uh, losing someone uh, close to them that could have easily been prevented if the state hadn't intervened yeah. uh, in their lives. Um, some people were just uh, obstructed from even helping others. You know, it was just... I love the stories, too, and I try to get a, a big, broad kind of perspective on, like, you know, the kind of spectrum of libertarians, you know, from uh, maybe the, the anarcho-capitalist to, you know, the, you know, maybe people more concerned about, say, the drug war or foreign policy. And, and I definitely identify, I mean, it was very enjoyable to, you know, as, as much as it, you know, affects you to hear these sad stories or just, you know, it was, it was enjoyable, like, learning about these people's experiences and, just their frustrations and, you know, what led them to what really is a positive movement. I mean, the liberty movement is a very positive movement. It's not about, you know, there's this classic, you know, don't tread on me, but it's really about don't tread on anyone. Like, let's just let people enjoy their lives and not obstruct them from, you know, benefiting themselves and others. Right. I, I also find that, that people who want freedom want to extend that freedom to other people. Um, I, now, you went over a lot of different topics in the book. Um, what did you uh, think about all the different people that you were interacting with in this book? Uh, what, what did you think about their history, their lives, and uh, you know their experiences, uh, uh, you know, dealing with the state? Yeah, I, I think one thing I got out of it was, as bad as things are here sometimes in the states for people, it is really much worse for a lot of people overseas, um, particularly Africa and Eastern Europe, um, a bit of Latin America, and. Uh, it, it makes you more frustrated that, you know, we, we have relative freedom compared to them, and yet we, we don't often appreciate it, and I just, it makes you want to do something, you know, there's more like, you know, there's a certain sense from some people that, you know, oh, you know, I'll stay with America and, you know, make America, but I have definitely, you know, I don't, you know, I'm an American, but I don't, I feel like, you know, I'm a citizen of the world, and I want to help everyone achieve this freedom, and, you know, a lot of people are really um, oppressed. By state aggression, and, you know, in, in this book, th- there's a good amount of it. You see some people, you know, being activists against the government and either personally being harmed or their 
fellow activists being harmed. Um, I'm actually working on another book now called Why Peace, and that is deals a lot more with you know active state aggression, um, you know force of arms against you know civil liberties and imprisoning people and wars, and uh, it's become so it's very much on my mind now in in working with this next project. Um, so you know, I, I guess you know all of it just leads to more empathy and kind of appreciation for what freedoms we, we still have and you know. It, relative economic and personal freedoms we enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I, I was struck by a couple of examples that you're talking about. I mean, I mean, the physical outright brutality in other countries is, is something that we don't actually see here. This is more of a uh, velvet glove. It's a, it's a coercion, but, you know, people just go along with it. Whereas in other countries, they have to physically actually use uh, brutality. Um, uh, an example was uh, with Zimbabwe, where uh, the leader there was uh, uh, disappearing people. They were kidnapping people in the middle of the streets who were involved in political activism. Right. Um, the, uh, there was all sorts of uh, massive land theft and pollution in uh, places like Nigeria. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff all over the world that, that we would just uh, be appalled at. But we also have to understand that here uh, we do have a, 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 a lot of coercion that is telling us what we can and can't do, how we can live our lives. And, you know, we, we have to recognize and, and, of course, empathize with the, the people who face it outright. Yeah, I mean, there's a passive acceptance here. I mean, we don't have a lot of stories in the news about, I mean, there are stories, I mean, if you, especially with the Internet. I mean, you definitely read about either, you know, wrong door knocks or just, you know, inappropriate raids and people getting um, either accidentally or purposely harmed or shot by um, officers of the state. And it's just not on a massive scale. And, you know, and, and for the most part in the states, if you don't resist, I mean, you're just, you know, you're charged and, you know, prosecuted. But you're, like you're saying, in Zimbabwe and certainly other places, you know, there's no, there's no not resisting. I mean, they're, they're coming for you. And regardless of what you do, you're going to be either imprisoned or, like you said, uh, you know, gone missing. Right. Um, I, I talked with someone the other day, and I, I told them that here it is more uh, theatrical. There's a, a bunch of symbolism. There's you, you walk into a courtroom, and you know you have this uh, this uh, procedure that occurs. Um, so you don't actually see the coercion. You know, they just send you off to jail, as opposed to other countries where they use physical brute force. So that's um. Uh, but I, I don't see too much uh, difference in terms of the morality of the situation. You know, if you grab somebody out of their home uh, for you know experiencing drugs or something like that and you lock them into a, a jail cell, I mean, that's, that's not too much different. Even if you have all these court procedures in place, uh, not too much different than, you know, all, all of the stuff that people experience in the foreign world. Yeah, I don't know why there's a tacit acceptance of that in, by the populace here. I don't know if it's just the media and just, the, I mean, it's just over time, the general acceptance. I mean, I don't know what you think about why we've consented to this. And I know you probably agree with me that, you know, governments rule by the consent of the governed, you know, and that's true for even... Like we're talking about brutal dictatorships or oligarchies. I mean, they still rule by the consent because people, you know, the North Koreans don't, they don't get information, right? So, I mean, in, in a way, even though they don't really have a say, I mean, they are consenting because they're not revolting. You know, there's not a massive uprising like there was recently in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, and we certainly don't have that here, not that I recommend us being violent towards anyone. But um, I don't know why we consent to it. I don't know. I'm always confused when people just don't, you know, right all the way go, yeah, yeah, you're right, you know, I never thought of it that way. Yes, it's just, of course it's wrong to lock people up for abusing their bodies, you know, or trading sex or, you know, whatever else, you know, we've criminalized. Right. I mean, people are just bombarded with this type of uh, uh, misinformation, you know, just telling them to go along with it. Um, uh, but I want to get back to um, another topic. Uh, it, it seemed like many of the people in the book, uh, work directly for the government, and th through this, they they came to libertarianism. They yeah. they realized something about the government that they were serving, and they came forth and said, "This is problematic." Um, can you uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know how that perception might have molded their um, uh, stance towards liberty? Yeah, I was particularly interested in those um, contributions because it, you know just had that experience. I mean, some of the people you mentioned were either you know State Department or Defense Department employees. You know, one worked in the Department of Commerce, um, another was a, a police officer in Canada, uh, and, and the Zimbabwean man you were discussing was, he had worked for, like, a public service department and was realizing that they were sending checks to ghost people, you know, millions of dollars. And um, I thought, you know, Ken, Ken Schoolin, who's in Hawaii now, he worked for the Department of Commerce, and he was 
you know, pretty high up. I mean, I think he was, you know, in the, he was in the White House. And people, and, you know, he got, I don't know, disgusted is the right word, but you know, it just wasn't, you know, worthy endeavor for him. It's not how he wanted to spend his life. He didn't feel like he was adding any value or create anything special for anyone. And he resigned. Everyone thought, you know, all his colleagues thought he was crazy because he was just on a fast track to, you know, be an important guy in Washington. And he said that it's just, uh, he felt like that was just a mentality, like it was just furthering your career regardless of any outcome. Or um, I thought Karen Kakowski, she worked in the Defense Department actually at the Pentagon. And she was, you know, she started off, you know, a cold warrior. You know, she thought, you know, we had this enemy, the communist regime, and to Asia, and we really need to have this kind of vast military defense hegemony across the globe, and she was very excited that the, the Berlin Wall came down, and kind, communism pretty much, you know, fell for the most part, and she thought, great, we're going to, you know, we're going to retract, I mean, we're going to stop spending all this money and deploying all these troops, and this is going to be a great time for the U.S. and for the world, and she was very disappointed that, it, you know, quite the opposite was true, that things beefed up. And that uh, we were continu- continuing our hegemony, and she felt for nefarious reasons, and she did some whistleblowing activity and quickly resigned. Um, but it, at least the people who contributed to the book, and actually my next book as well, describe very negative experiences with the government and the state and the people they work within the state. Right. I remember one um, that was talking about the Forest Service that, that struck me. Oh, um, yeah. Those were, yeah, the environmentalists have some great comments, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was just talking about how they were clear-cutting forests and how they were doing all this stuff. And he uh, became a consultant and started calling them out on their paperwork and, you know, showing that the, what they were reporting was entirely incorrect and, and things like that. And, you know, he originally was with them and then, you know, started calling them out and, and became very well esteemed, uh, you know, as a, a person who was saying, look, this money is uh, going nowhere and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah, he started off as a, like you said, as a private consultant, but basically very much in, in line with, you know, the foresting, you know, the national forest industry. And Randall O'Toole, he actually is at uh, Cato now, I believe. And uh, he eventually realized that all the policies created incentives that actually would make the, the park rangers and the people who worked in the foresting industry actually harm the forest and do bad foresting policy. Just because their incentives were so skewed by the policies, whether it was, I mean, for the most part, you described like how they obtained their money, and uh, I don't remember the specifics now, but it incentivized them to do harm rather than good. And there's another guy named Max Falk in the book. He's from France, and he works for I don't know the, the department's name in France, but he said that these policies were outright harmful to the environment, and that there was no way he would continue in that position and you know end up becoming a free market environmentalist. Um, I don't remember the, unfortunately, the specifics of, of this story now, but that is a, that is a great chapter as well in the book. Yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. The people that see this kind of corruption outright, um, you know, they realize it and they recognize it and they call it out as it is. Um, and another group of uh, uh, people who find uh, that coercion outright is the business people, the people who are trying to serve their customers. Um, you know, they have uh, uh, their dreams just quashed by just endless rows of uh, bureaucrats, um, you know, lined up ready to inspect them. Or, or sometimes they can't even start the business that they want to because there's just rows and rows of uh, paperwork and all of this stuff that they have to jump through and e- in order to even even start that. Um, what, what effects do you think that has on uh, economic progress if, if these business people can't even, you know, start their own business? And if they do, they get, you know, attacked by these regulations. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, it should be clear to, to most anyone that this, you know, harms everyone, including the entrepreneur, but it mostly harms the consumer. I mean, it raises prices, it protects cartels, it, you know, blocks, and this is because it blocks entry into the market, and usually it's the, you know, they say that, you know, no one hates capitalism as much as capitalists, because the people who are there, who have the industry, are already in the industry, they don't want competition. They want these regulations. They, it, it, these regulations hurt, you know, they, it gives them a competitive advantage because it hurts these smaller outfits who can't afford all this regulatory overhead. Um, so it's the, it's the consumer that's, that's harmed. I think a lot of people don't realize that in free markets, prices tre- trend towards zero. I mean, a lot of people have the idea, oh, in free markets, you know, there, there's monopolies and, you know, uh, cartels and it, it harms the consumer and we need the government to put in these re- regulations to make things fair for the consumer and, you know, equalize and referee the market. But I think what we find, and I think John Stossel does an excellent point and, you know, writes about this in his article, 
is that you know the the, the enemy is the uh, uh, perfect the enemy of the good, right? Like all these regulations that were put in place weren't helping the consumer; it was harming the consumer. It um, makes us all poor. It decreases our wealth, and it's wealth that you know it's having wealth that allows us to educate our children and you know provide for our health care and the health care of others and aid others and you know invest in art and whatever else we enjoy the things we delight in um edu- and i think i said education but um i think these regulations go a long way in making us less prosperous in the in you know the so-called effort of either consumer safety or but it doesn't make us safer it makes us poorer and less safe and that's, a, that's an unfortunate result of these right. you know maybe they're well intended but the results are poor, and it's very expensive too. Right. You know, just the cost of the re- regulations for the businessmen that you're discussing, and then the, the cost to private actors in the market, just are all opportunity costs that we all lose on. Right, absolutely, and it's the, the large companies that have the capital to uh, pass these regulations or to pay them off. Um, they they really have a lot of capital to flow around to kind of handle the situation. So they know that the regulations are really going to affect their competitors, the smaller guy, the the people that are just coming on the scene and trying to compete with them. They they realize that this is of major benefit to them and is going to keep uh, them on the market longer than pro- probably they should be. Right, and they rather invest their money in lobbyists. Right. than in actually competing, because competing is much harder. And like I said, it drives their profits to zero, the prices to zero, and it gives them a very small margin on their profits. So they find, you know, the fact that, I mean, that has to cross people's mind. The fact that it, it's actually beneficial to spend millions on lobbying congressmen is actually more beneficial than investing in your own company. It just says so much to me. <laughs> like, that right. should be enough for anyone to understand that it's, you know, a, a racket. Right. So spending millions of dollars versus buying a couple more machines in order to make your workers more productive, uh, there's something wrong with that. So. Right. And who's going to go, you know, who's going to, like, you and I, you know, like, our sugar costs, you know, $12 more a year on average because of sugar tariffs. Like, you and I aren't going to be because of $12 a year for an organization, that pay, you know, pay for a lobbyist, pay for advertisement to go up against the sugar producers who sure are going to, you know, protect their tariff. I mean, it's just not worth the fight. I mean, and that's the thing about using government to kind of, I don't want to say solve problems, but to interact. I mean, it just, it, it, it makes cooperative part- participants into adversaries, and it makes us fight. I mean, there's just, there's no, there's no way that's a blueprint for a harmonious society, that we're going to, you know, allow government to push through any special will it wants, and if we don't like it, then we need to toil and spend our money to convince others to get power within the government to undo these, you know, burdens and impositions on us. I mean, there's no way that if anyone looks at that critically, can say, oh, yeah, that's fair. That's, that's, a, that's how you get harmony and prosperity. It, does, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It, it, can't, it can't make sense. Um, now, there was a couple of specific examples in the book which really stuck out at me as powerful. Uh, Jans Jones Stover uh, explains how her son, on his first day of school in kindergarten, was told that he would be arrested by police officers if he refused to stay with the teachers. If he insisted on going home with his parents, as he expressed the desire to, uh, he was going to be put in a jail cell. Um, I mean, I, I can't imagine a, a better s- story and scenario to explain how government functions and the nature of government. Yeah, I think that that actually is a chilling story. I, I, I see your point saying that, you know, that's an example of how government functions, and, and it kind of is, but I think that's a subtle, you know, I think the teacher just wanted to, you know, be a little, you know, show a little authority, tell the kid how it's going to be, and, and, and that, that probably is, you know, somewhat of a, um, just kind of a, uh, a vibe you get when you work for the government, you know, that you can actually kind of force your way. But um, it definitely is how the government works. And actually, you know, if you don't go our way, there, there will be a police officer at the end of it, and he will be carrying a gun. Um, and it's definitely no nothing I'd want. I mean, I, I have two children. They're going to be in the public schools. One already is. And, I, I, you know, I don't get too worried about that too much because, you know, they have me at home and my wife. But I, I am concerned about them growing up, you know, obeying, you know, obeying the authority and obeying what they're told. Like, I mean, they certainly need to have a, a, a feeling that they can think for themselves and they don't have to obey. They certainly shouldn't be hurting anyone or being disruptive in the classroom. You know, and it has a difficult balance as a parent. I don't think you have children, but um, that's definitely something I'm going to have to keep an eye on. And you're right, yeah, you know, that is a 
small little microcosm of how the government operates. You know, the police officer will come and tell you how it's going to be. Right. I think it was um, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Healing Our World? Was it um, Mary? Mary Ruart, yeah. Mary Ruart. She uh, wrote something uh, along the lines of, uh, if we're trying to teach kids that coercion is wrong, then why do we have our school system that's based on coercion? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you know, there. And I, I mean, I should mention, but, you know, there's a, uh, a contribution to my next book by uh, Bertine Schaffner. And she actually discusses how when she was in high school, there was a couple kids beating up on a, you know, bullying a kid in school. And a, her fr- a friend of her said, you know, see, that's what happens in anarchy. You get bullying. And she's like, you know, I, I really wish at the time I thought to tell him, you know, that's not what you get in anarchy. That's, that's what you get when you have kids in a government school that are taught that might, makes right. I mean, they are told by their teachers how it's going to be or they're going to be punished. And they're just acting like they were taught. She's like, you know, I spent some time at a Montessori school, and that wasn't how we were taught. It wasn't might makes right. It was we were free to think and decide and discuss. And I never saw anyone get bullied, or not to any large extent. And I think you're right. I think that it is taught that might makes right. And some people often bring up Lord of the Flies, and I think those kids in that book, of course it's fiction, were you know, mimicking the wars that were going on and how, you know, states were overpowering people. Right, absolutely. Um, so what was your favorite topic in the book, and what has been your um, particular passion uh, in, in spreading libertarianism and, and writing about it? You know, it evolved. You know, um, I think when I started out, it was kind of just, you know, the economic stuff we were talking about. And and then in the in the book, I thought, that, you know, unfortunately, uh, someone, someone contributed a story to the book, and there were a few stories about people on public assistance programs or entitlement programs and how it actually kind of harmed their loved ones or them themselves. And, you know, unfortunately, this guy, in the end, decided not to allow the, his story in the book. But he wrote a story about how he was like a big brother to this 14-year-old kid, and um, the kid lived with his grandparents, and I think his parents had died, and his parents got a check every week or month from the government, and they gave it to the kid. And the kid would, you know, either spend it on something, but usually he would save it up and buy himself a bike or something like that. And... Uh, you know, this you know, this guy always tried to engage him and you know try to encourage him. You know, what are you going to do after high school? And the kid said, uh, you know, I'm not going to do anything. The government's going to take care of me forever. And that was a real dramatic moment for him. He's like, man, they just crushed you know everything for this 14 year old kid. This kid has no aspiration whatsoever and has no you know even thoughts of caring for himself because he's going to be cared for forever. And he he felt that in that in that situation probably most that he was going to have a very bleak life, um, unfulfilling and just, you know, not having a lot of personal rewards and just general rewards. Um, so, you know, I used to think about that stuff a lot, but, you know, in the last 10 years, I mean, you can't ignore the foreign policy of the United States. Um, it's been going on for decades, of course, but I've been certainly more aware of it. I mean, we're, at, we're on six fronts right now in six different countries bombing innocent people, and, and that's why I'm working on this next book, Why Peace. I only touched on that in this book, Why Liberty. Um, but I think that's the most important thing we need to deal with right now. It's the most costly in, in lives and and just our general wealth, and it's, I mean, it's just so immoral and it's nefarious. And you know, I feel terrible for these soldiers and their family members. You know, they're putting in harm's way, and they're asked to do horrible things for, you know, not for freedom and not for defense. I mean, it's really for, you know, aggression and whether it's for empire or you know, private business. But um, I think that's really the first thing we need to all tackle together. And there's been a really growing and I'm pretty, you know, optimistic about this growing kind of progressive libertarian unity towards the ending these wars and the state aggression and the civil liberty infringements. So I think it's really the most important topic right now for me. Yeah, I mean, what what could possibly be more destructive than dropping bombs and blowing up buildings and killing people? I mean, there, there's nothing that could possibly be more destructive than that. So yeah, I mean, it's just massive scale of violence. Yeah, it is. It is. So and destruction. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I've been listen- I've been uh, talking with Mark Gutman. Uh, he's the author of Why Liberty: Personal Journeys Towards Peace and Freedom. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today, uh, Mark, and I, I appreciate it. I hope that we can chat again sometime soon in the future. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And if I could just, my website is uh, whyliberty.com, W-H-Y-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y.com. Thanks a lot, Rocker. I appreciate it. Whyliberty.com. Thanks a lot, Mark.